One of the things that we have going on these days is that we aren't quite sure how to handle the end of life. We don't talk about it, and we as a society, I guess, at least in America, have gotten better at figuring out how to keep a body alive than we have at figuring out how to maintain quality of life. And that's one of the things that kind of led me to thinking about doing 36 days. Partly it was just a personal reflection. I started making the drawings as a way to kind of figure out how I was thinking about my dad's passing. Partly also because it seems like we need to address the more complicated and nuanced questions that arise from end-of-life conversations. My family actually had had the conversations, but it turns out that you think things are relatively straightforward and easy, and then life is nice and complicated and weird. I started with this image of the foam because so much of my relationship to my parents at the time was over the foam. And this is actually, it's hard to tell, I suppose, in such a minimal drawing, but it is a payphone. Um, maybe the little extra blob there and the thickness of that wire would indicate, maybe the shape would indicate, but part of the idea was that in this age of cell phones, a payphone still reads as a symbol of telecommunication, but it also feels sort of distanced or broken. And especially in this age of cell phones, there are a few circumstances under which you would use a payphone, and it seems like all of them would be bad. So part of the idea was to use that as a kind of indicator that things weren't right. Uh, the imagery along here is actually abstractions based on writing out the conversations that I was having with my mom and then folding them over each other on tracing paper and then kind of tracing the letter forms as they turned into these sort of abstractions. And then, as you can see, we're going to have a couple more later on and the idea is that the text gets more frantic, and so the way in which it's drawn changes too. This one was um, based on overlays of the different places that we've moved uh, with solid lines indicating the changes in location within the United States, and then the dashed lines are showing changes as we move across the ocean. Driving is love. Um, one of the ideas also is the sort of inability of American men to communicate. Sorry guys, it's true. Um, and the way in which therefore our actions sometimes become the way in which we demonstrate love. This is the path that my dad took when he drove from San Angelo to Austin uh, every weekend in the station wagon to be home for the weekend, even though he was stationed uh, eight hours away from home. The, um, this one is uh, based on an alarm clock that I actually did use uh, when I was in college. The problem with an old school alarm clock like this, though, is that there is no snooze button. So then you have to actually get up that's no good. Fortunately, we've pro solved that problem with phones. Uh, this is one of two drawings that is uh, still has a little bit of graphite in there. I would lightly draw in the forms with graphite. And when I was adding in the EKG lines from Dad's readout, I felt like I didn't want to cross the uh, face of the clock and so I just left those in graphite and then went back to ink when I got to the other side. Um, also, it's uh, set on the, uh, at the day that Dad had the false alarm, so uh, 11, 23, 24. I have to look it up. That's sort of sad. Oh, we have to talk about this one because that is Bear Jr. 
Bear Jr. is my daughter's uh, teddy bear from when she was uh, a wee little child. Uh, it is Bear Jr. because my wife's teddy bear was named Bear. We're a very creative family. Uh, and I was also trying to set this up sort of as a, an equation. So like the phone call, getting ready, packing up the family, and then driving. Uh, the story of taking my mom to Thanksgiving dinner and driving and paying and therefore being an adult now uh, turned out to be a little more true than I realized. Part of why it was significant to me is that like she didn't even think about the idea that she was going to pay uh, as the parent because the man always pays. That's what we're for. And so when she and I went alone to Thanksgiving dinner because dad was in the hospital um, with that first uh, big health scare, a uh, pattern was established that like it was my job now to take care of things. Ah, uh, Dad's recliner. These are TV listings. I'm not sure if anybody's ever been able to recognize that. The idea was to sort of make a play on um, a uh, wooden floor and yet still take like the cable segment. So we'd have like a half hour program versus an hour long program versus a longer program. I cheated on this and uh, did not use uh, dad's actual pills. Uh, these are medicines that were in his medicine cabinet after he died. Um, so some of this was cleaning out uh, as opposed to the ones he was actively taking uh, prior to going into the hospital. And then a uh, transfusion bag. So yeah, we're starting to see the phone get a little more agitated and kind of break out, uh, occupying more of the space. And then all heck breaks loose. So the surgery that Dad had uh, after his stroke was what's called burr hole surgery. And these are the drawings based on the patents of the instruments that you use. Essentially, there's a stabilizer here to make sure that you're going through the skull. And then they have specially adapted uh, drill bits, essentially, to drill a little hole. Uh, what they were trying to do was relieve the pressure that was building up from the excess blood and then trying to create uh, a series of sort of network paths that show how these pieces related to each other and then also relate to where in uh, dad's brain he was having the surgery while also kind of showing that massive confusion that all those intersecting lines uh, will result in. Mom's punch bowl. So this is actually what she always calls Sissy's punch bowl, which is her mother. Uh, so my grandmother's punch bowl. Uh, this is actually something that is part of family discussion right now, because when mom moved into the memory care unit at her senior living facility, one of the conversations was if she should not have uh, important, fragile, breakable, valuable things. And I have no idea as to the actual value of my grandmother, now mother's, punch bowl. Uh, it's a frilly China, uh, China porcelain pink and white thing with gold trim. And then it's got this little pedestal that's got a mirrored base so that you can see blah, 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 blah. One of the conversations that we were having with the memory care folks was like, should somebody who is in cognitive decline not have this? And I pointed that out because she might break it. And I pointed out that she loves this punch bowl more than she loves me. So it was going to be important that it be in her room. Um, trying to sort of think about what dad was going through and also the waiting game that we were playing. This is um, drawing the hands of the clock that was the uh, grandmother's clock that uh, my parents have in their house, um, along with brainwave patterns where we're trying to figure out whether or not dad is, um, you see, he was sedated, but whether or not his brain was functioning as it should have been. Um, 
and then platoon because my mom did not have a great relationship with the doctors. They would come in, they would go out really fast. She always wanted them to slow down, always wanted a little bit more time. She also had to go through a, a sort of grieving process every time they would tell her anything. And um, they didn't really have an accommodation for that kind of thing. They would tell her something and she would need time to think through what it meant before she could ask any questions and they were already out the door. So there was lots of coming back afterward. Uh, as is manif manifested in the uh, arguments, conversations, discussion, debate, not sure what the right word is there, uh, as to whether or not Dad should be uh, given a tracheotomy. He it was uh, obese, and it was therefore very difficult for the doctors initially to intubate him. And even when it was time to take the breathing tube out, they didn't trust that he would be able to breathe on his own, and they didn't want to have to try to intubate him again because they were already concerned that he had lost oxygen to the brain during the surgery process, so they wanted to put in a tracheotomy. Um, ultimately, it wasn't really that traumatic or uh, difficult of a decision. It's just that, again, the communication between mom and the doctors was such that when they said, okay, we're going to do this, she basically said, what? and wanted to fight it because she didn't know what was going on and didn't like the idea of them cutting another hole in Dad. Um, this is one of my artistic quotations. It's actually the scales from a Durer etching of the um, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and Death carries those scales uh, as an indicator of the judgment to come. And here I'm sort of thinking about the uh, judgment to come and what's going on. And this uh, is a series of graphs uh, that indicate the fatality rates for leukemia patients based on a certain age and how quickly they're intervened. Uh, the leukemia, leukemia treatments start the interventions. Um, so here the generation of judgments is, is sort of thinking about how we're all going to have to figure out what we want to do with things. That was Dad's actual hospital recliner on uh, these giant casters for this relatively tiny uh, little um, space uh, for my huge dad to fit into. Um, these lines that sometimes show up, I tried to have at least one image and then one sort of linear element in each of the drawings. And these are based on drawings of the architecture of the nurse's station just outside Dad's room. You can sort of make out here like the chair, like a rolling office chair silhouette, and then the computer that they work on, and then the wall, and on like that. Part of the idea here was that the abstractions would have meaning, but they would also kind of operate as a bracket. So this line is going to complement the line that is on Mom's punch bowl that I just passed uh, because I think of them as kind of a unit. And so like having the parenthetical almost of my parents together bracketed by this line, but also separated because the lines no longer are matching up. It's getting into the weeds of overthinking things, but there you go. That's what we artists do. Ah, uh, the grass. What I was uh, referring to here is a specific anecdote where Dad would just get annoyed at how I would not do a good job of uh, mowing the lawn when I was a teenager in the Texas heat, partly because I was a teenager, and partly because of the Texas heat. But also, um, it came to mind because he would get really frustrated with the nurses who didn't do whatever he wanted when they were trying to start um, therapies, and uh, especially occupational therapy, and see if he could move and things like that. He was also going in and out of either being sedated or being so sleepy that he might as well have been sedated. But this was when we were still trying to figure out 
uh, how healthy dad was going to be and whether or not he was going to recover from the stroke. Here's helping mom um, with all of the pots and pans. Dad actually became like quite the cook towards the end of his life. And uh, this manifested itself in him buying everything that Williams or Sonoma had ever made. Um, most of which was these big, huge, heavy pots that my mom couldn't handle, like physically couldn't handle. And so there was some rearranging that had to be done to accommodate mom. Um, it was tricky to figure out, you know, are we at the end? Partly because um, dad was so unresponsive, and yet at the same time you sort of feel like you should be hoping for your dad to recover. And in my mom's case, um, she was adamant that she wanted to follow his wishes and that he didn't want to be someone who was artificially kept alive. At the same time, whenever there was an intervention, her first reaction would be to uh, um, go ahead and want to keep Dad alive and then to second-guess herself constantly and not know what was happening, partly because Dad was so uncommunicative after the stroke that we didn't really know uh, if we were prolonging the inevitable or setting him up for recovery or what to do. So these questions are, are always kind of difficult. So mom's solution, whenever faced with a difficult question, was research. So she would just read and reread and draw lines and brackets and check marks and stars around all of the uh, information that she could get. Uh, the Medicare and You book from uh, that year. And then this was the journal that she was keeping where she was trying to write down uh, her thoughts and her reactions uh, and her frustrations with the doctors and other things. Uh, here's the family conference, my station wagon, my mom's station wagon, and my brother flying in so that we could have the conversation about what we're doing. Um, and then when we went to try to talk to dad, uh, he had recovered enough that he could talk, but he was indicating the um, sort of cognitive decline that was ultimately going to get worse and worse over the next couple of days. Because when he discovered that he was restrained in the hospital bed so that he wouldn't pull out his IV and things, he kept saying that it was because he was uh, trapped in a seatbelt and that he couldn't get out of the parking lot and that my mom and my wife Jennifer and my brother's wife Kate had already gone into the store but he was stuck here in the um, parking lot. It's really kind of amazing the way in which the brain works even when it's not working. It was clear that Dad was trying to like rejoin the family but couldn't rejoin the family and for whatever reason hospital bed turned into car and restraints turned into seat belt. Um, so that was the parking lot and his seat belt. This one's also derived from patent drawings so that I could get a kind of schematic of the different parts that go into a uh, seatbelt. Ah, uh, the representation of Dad's stories. Um, tomato plants became kind of a shorthand symbol for Dad's uh, growing up with my grandfather. Uh, Papa was originally a farmer before moving to the big city of Richmond, Virginia, but always kept a garden, and Dad uh, sporadically would try to uh, create one, although we moved so much due to his being in the Army that it didn't always happen. These are the uh, restraints. They used the sort of cotton ticking uh, tape uh, to tie Dad's hands to the uh, rails of his bed. And then he used to tell a story, uh, one of his own favorite stories was um, about going rabbit hunting with his dad and um, the way in which my father, um, apparently what happens when you're rabbit hunting is that you have a dog flush out the rabbit and rabbits, when they're trying to escape both you and the dog, run in a huge circle 
Uh, the idea being that they don't want to go too far from their warren, but they want to lead you away initially before circling back and trying to find a place to hide. And what you as the hunter are supposed to do is apparently to shoot the little bunny, which just seems mean to me, uh, but, you know, Dad was bonding with his dad, uh, to shoot the little bunny when the uh, dog flushes it and runs it and chases it past you. Um, but there was a story that Dad had of the first time he went where he kept missing, and the dog chased the rabbit so that the rabbit circled around three times, and Dad missed every time, uh, until finally the dog just sort of sat down and stared at my uh, dad in abject disappointment. Uh, so, bunny rabbit. Uh, also, a uh, quote from a Durer uh, print, in this case one with rabbits. Um, the kind of jeep that dad would have been responsible for um, because as he uh, was sliding further into the uh, decline that ultimately would claim him, he kept feeling like there was something he should be doing. And uh, one time he was telling the story of um, trying to, actually it wasn't a story to him, in his head he needed urgently to uh, get a jeep so that he could deliver water to uh, some of his soldiers. This is a, a representation of a hospital bed as filtered through the uh, compositional structure of Rauschenberg's bed. So another art historical quote there, um, thinking about Dad's empty bed. And we're continuing with the art history quote. So here we've got uh, a wing and a uh, hourglass and another um, balance that are all derived from the uh, various works by Albrecht Dürer again. I was thinking about Dürer a lot in part because when we as a family were living in Germany, uh, we actually went to Nuremberg and we uh, toured um, all over Germany, including uh, Albrecht Dürer's studio uh, and home. And so he's always been kind of important to our family and therefore is kind of an interesting symbol of art, but also family history. And then there's something about the precision, but also archaic manner uh, in which Durer is going to create an image that seemed appropriate to sort of thinking about the weight of history and these sort of huge decisions the clock, uh, the hourglass is a symbol of life's um, slipping away from us, an angel's wing, the balance of uh, these weighty issues. And again here, similar to the one before, uh, these are, instead of leukemia success rates, these are um, graphs showing the typical success rates of strokes. Crossword puzzle and comfort care. So comfort uh, as symbolized by the sock. But also this is me being really petty because one of the things that... Um, so I was grumpy at Dad a lot after he died, especially because it seemed like the cause of death was so much of his own not taking care of himself. And so the way in which he was mean inadvertently to someone that I loved. Uh, part of the frustration also was just like the decisions that your parents make that are not the decisions that you would make. For example, despite the fact that we grew up not in a impoverished home, but the army doesn't pay especially well, and so uh, things were fairly lean growing up, in a way that builds character, as we all know. Um, and then it was interesting to see Dad, once he retired, um, be sort of uh, extravagant, uh, as in this case represented by the fact that when I was clearing out Dad's uh, things, he had 187 pairs of socks, which is a ridiculous number, and kind of offensive that, you know, you would allocate your limited financial resources so poorly. And even if your financial resources aren't that limited, spending that kind of money 
when you could have paid off the student loans of your children or grandchildren or uh, fed the hungry or done something useful that would have gotten you out of the house and kept you healthy and moving. Any of those things seem like better choices than accumulating 187 pairs of socks. And I hasten to uh, clarify also that this wasn't because he never threw away ratty old socks. They were all pristine, brand new. One of my mom's cousins who lives in Wyoming came down to Colorado to help with the cleaning out and uh, moving when mom was moving out of the house that she and dad shared at the end. And uh, her line was that she'd never seen such neatly organized hoarders, but there was just so much stuff. I cut that from the book because it just seemed really, really petty, but yeah, Dad had a lot of socks. All gold toe, too, because, you know, quality matters. This is actually not my father's watch. It is my grandfather's watch, but therefore a kind of good symbol for uh, fatherly uh, devotion and family heirlooms. And uh, the watch became my father's and then became mine because of uh, the passing of generations. These are also my grandfather's tools that my father inherited and now I've inherited. And I've actually, because I had already bought my own tools, packed them away for my son to inherit. And so we'll keep going on through the generations. I was initially going to split them between my son and my daughter, but my daughter seemed to think that she did not need a bunch of tools that were really old and like the ball peen hammer, the head actually is about to come off if you were to swing it hard because the wood is so old that it no longer has a tight seal. So we'll see if when he's older, my son is interested in the idea of a tool as an heirloom. They were for me such a, a kind of potent symbol of like what a man does around the house. He helps, he works, he does those kinds of things. Heaven forbid he talk or play games or hug his children or anything like that. But you know, when the kitchen sink is uh, dripping, we, we got a tool for that. And then the stillness uh, at the end for Dad. This was intended to reference the IV drops that had been happening earlier in the book where uh, the water dripping down as a sort of symbol for both time but also life slipping away. In that sense, kind of using a water version of an hourglass. And then this is the last ripple stilling. And then... These are three of the shell casings from Dad's funeral. He was uh, given a military burial and they um, fired uh, the rifles as part of the salute. And then, I hadn't seen this before, but at least at Fort Logan, they put the casing in the flag that had been in the coffin when they filled up the flag and presented it to my mom. And then this is a, a photo, or a drawing based on a photograph at Fort Logan of um, the graves and erasing all but one uh, to reference the, the one person that I know who is there. The mountains in the background, the flag at permanent half staff because it's a military cemetery, and then this uh, tree because um, I took the photograph in winter and so it doesn't have the, the life of the evergreens but balances out the sort of precarious fragility of the flagpole. So we're going to do a little bit of a studio visit here. My studio is in the basement of my home. Fancy, fancy floor, which is MDF, that I put down mostly just to uh, try to save the carpet. But I wanted to highlight it because all of the light blue-gray rectangles are actually from when I was staining the paper for 36 days. So I come into my studio every time and have a quick reminder of my dad and that project. And most of the work actually happens at this uh, sort of drawing table that I've made out of some recycled glass. The drawings that I make are often 
on 15 inch paper, about that big, um, but we'll then have leftover pieces um, and that is what I use for more personal or uh, kind of intimately scaled works and things like that. Uh, so we're going to turn on my highly sophisticated uh, lighting system here. And continuing with the theme of sophistication, my paper tearing uh, system is to tape down a T-square and have a little mark that shows me how big to make the uh, paper. So all of the works in 36 days are seven inches square. That number was determined in part by frugality. That's the number that um, is left over. But also seven seemed like a uh, kind of good symbolic number for important themes of life and death. This paper is actually a printmaking paper. And part of the reason for that is that when I was in grad school, it was cheaper than the watercolor paper. And I was broke. So I used this for a series of drawings. And one of the things that was nice about it, other than the fact that it was archival rag paper and a little less expensive, was that I discovered that it actually holds kind of every mark. So you can't really erase on it. It always kinds of shows the history of whatever you've done to the paper, which I kind of liked. I often think of drawings almost as objects or artifacts. So some of the motivation for working this size for 36 days, it was just an appropriately intimate size, right? Like if you're going to create something that is a memorial to your father, to really talk about family, it makes sense that it's something small, that it can essentially be held in your hand, both when you're making it and after it's done. It's small enough to fit sort of inside your body. It's the size of your heart. Well, maybe not literally, unless you have like terrible health. But it's something that kind of fits inside your chest. And so it made sense that it was that size. Also, I think my tendency to want to use every little scrap of everything is kind of my dad's fault too, in the sense that because we were in the army, we moved around a lot. And one of the things that happened when we were moving around a lot is that we had to always make sure that we were under our weight limit for our home goods when we were moving, say, across the country or from America to Germany or something like that. If we had too much stuff, we had to get rid of it. And so after we make the um, pieces the right size, then I'll start to stain them. And part of the idea here is to create a background to react against something that I can work with. This is obviously not the same series because we're dealing with green here instead of the blues. I was deliberately using blue as a sort of somber color of mourning. Essentially, it's layers of really thinned out acrylic paint uh, so that they work a lot like watercolor in the earlier stages and just adding another layer and then adding another layer and then adding another layer. Sometimes uh, by staining with these really old watercolor brushes, these are what are called goat hair brushes. They're really, really soft so that the water itself and the way it reacts with the paper can create the surface. In the case of the 36 days series, most of them went pretty far in terms of putting down a color and sanding back through and putting down a color and sanding back through. And that's why so many of the edges of the works themselves have this kind of eroded, uh, weathered feel uh, where corners get nicked or pieces come off. Um, 
So this, like the other ones, is a printmaking paper that's been stained with acrylic paint enough times to seal up the paint. And what I've done at this stage is lightly with pencil, I'm not even sure if you can see it, drawn in the compositions that are going to be on here. And then trying to figure out how I might layer other imagery. One of the things you're probably able to see in the 36 Days series is that there's a kind of commentary that happens where one image, in this case maybe the shell, has an image that is recognizable, that is going to have associations. You're going to look at that and you're going to think about what it means. Um, and then there's going to be something else that sort of comments. A lot of what I was doing with 36 Days was trying to have a linear element, either a diagram or a pattern or some sort of aspect that could comment on the other more recognizable imagery of it, so that it would be not just a scene from the hospital, but also medical diagrams or things from the charts or those kinds of things that were part of the experience. Because when we're looking at back on dad's time in the hospital, it's not just the flashes of memory of the specific instances I think about this particular medication hanging on an IV, but it's also the ramifications of that, the, the kind of ticking down of the dosage or the actuarial tables behind the um, thought process that they were using when they were trying to figure out whether or not they were going to sign things like the uh, uh, living will and that kind of stuff. This is the kind of thing that I never really expect anybody to notice, but you can see, if I point it out to you, that we go from a lighter blue to sort of a medium blue to a slightly darker blue as we're going from fresh water to mixed to salt water. I'm mentioning that partly because I did the same thing in 36 days. If you look at them all in sequence, it actually gets lighter as uh, we go through the series. So we start off with darker blues in 36 days and move to a background that starts to approach white. And part of what I was doing there was trying to kind of represent loss, not only in the individual images, but through the sequence, through all 36 of them, so that there was this element of time and narrative. The way in which the inevitable was um, the conclusion to which we were working. When I was doing 36 Days, I started the series after Dad had died, and so I knew that what I was doing was reflecting on an experience that was going to end in his death. You can see that I start with a pencil just to make sure that I get it in there and then we start layering up the ink and what I want you to see is why the background is not just about coming up with a pretty color and a nice surface upon which to work but the way in which it seals the paper and allows me to manipulate the value of the ink. And what I discovered one time, kind of by accident, is that when I build up the surface so that it's got all that paint on there, I then have an interesting thing happen when I try to draw on top of it with ink, which is that the paint keeps the ink from soaking into the paper so it sort of sits up on the surface just a little bit longer than it would on bare paper and that allows me to then come in with an eraser and sort of slide and smooth around so that I can get an effect almost like a wash but with the control of the pen. I'm using most of the time these Micron, um, you know, plug there, um, Micron 
pens, they're archival pigment-based inks. They come in a variety of nib sizes so that you can draw with either a really fine line, a slightly larger line that puts down more ink, or something that's big and fat and juicy. So some of the elements that feel a little lighter or more kind of memories, thoughts that are harder to capture are ones that I will draw and then erase back out so that there's still just kind of a whisper of the impression of the image. It's a little bit slower, but then there's a kind of meditative quality to drawing that I appreciate, especially when dealing with a series like 36 Days when you know, I'm still trying to figure out exactly how I do feel about the fact that somebody I love died and the way in which uh, I am reacting to how much of my dad I am but also how frustrated I am with him because he was not taking care of somebody that I love. That's what I'm doing right now is just trying to block in the pattern on the conch shell and then I'll come back in probably in another day or two and do more of the kind of work that we're seeing right there where I'm trying to use the hatching to create a sense of volume. This is a little bit flat, but it does have that kind of tiger pattern. And then once I've got that, I can try to use shading um, to create a sense of volume. Of course, We've got a little bit of a Schrodinger's thing going on here in the sense that your observation of me is changing my behavior because this is not an accurate representation of how I really work in the studio. How I really work in the studio is I don't listen to myself prattling on. I have to spend all day with that guy, and I'm not sure that I especially like him, and he never really has much to say. So what I do when I'm in just execution phase like this, where I've figured out the composition, I've made most of the decisions, and it's really just a matter of spending the time to create the work itself, what I'll do is listen to audiobooks. So being married to a librarian turns out to be a really great idea. A lot of what I wind up doing is listening to uh, really nerdy books so that I can uh, feel like a smart guy. I'm trying to remember if I know what I was listening to when I was working on 36 Days. It seems like... <sighs> There was a certain amount of Neil Gaiman in there. Like maybe I was listening to the Graveyard Book, really good book if uh, any of you are interested in mildly spooky, but mostly kind of uh, touching humorous kinds of books. I did a good amount of N.K. Jemison. She recently won the Hugo for her Broken Earth series. It's hard to talk and draw at the same time, as it turns out. 